Luke chapter 15, you guys all there? Chapter 15, all right, go ahead and stand up. Stand up, we're gonna read verses 11 through 19. Now, this parable goes all the way down to verse 32, but just for today and just for time's sake, we're gonna read verses 11 through 19. And now, just by way of reminder, maybe you're new here or you haven't been around since I've been having you guys stand. Um, I do it for a couple reasons. One, I wanna highlight the fact that the reason we're coming together to study the Bible is to study the Bible. We're not playing games. We're not messing around. Uh, I didn't buy pizza for you guys. Um, I know, I'm sorry. Although we did have cupcakes if you were here early enough. I think there's a few uh, scraps over there left. But all of that is good. I'm glad we're having fellowship. I'm glad we're friends and we're playing ping pong and hanging out. But we come to learn from God's eternal, infallible, never failing word. And so that's why I have you guys stand, so that we can point specifically to this time as we read the word. So now, follow along with me. I'll do all the reading, but beginning in verse 11, it says, Then he said, A certain man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and journeyed to a far country and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in the land and he began to be in want. It means he lacked basic necessities. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country and he, set, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. Verse 17. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. Let's pray. Father, this morning we've gathered together and we've sang to you, and that's good. The Bible says that we should lift up our voices. The Bible even says that we should play skillfully on all kinds of instruments and praise you loudly with loud voices, that we should lift up our hands as we sing, and we've done that. But Lord, now as we turn our attention to your word, I pray that you, by your spirit, would teach us that we would not leave here unchanged. Every single person in this room should leave changed by these words we're about to hear. Some students will leave being encouraged by the love of God. Others will leave maybe with their hearts hardened towards you yet more. Well, God, I pray that the message today that goes forth would soften each heart, God, and that you would speak to us through your word this morning. And so God, we give this time to you. We ask that you'd bless it in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and sit down. As you guys know, this is one of the most well-known parables. For all of you guys who grew up in the church, you grew up going and hearing the Bible stories and the felt board. You guys remember felt board, Jesus? You stick them on there. Sometimes you fall off and you pick them up and stick them back on. And this one, you'd have the father sitting and then the student helper, right? Some of you guys are student helpers. They'd be way over in the corner of the room with the prodigal son. And the teacher would say, look, look over in the corner of the room, it's the son. And then the father would hop off the felt board and they'd run and they'd meet in the middle. And that's what this parable is all about, is a father being reconciled to his son. But if we're not careful, we're gonna totally mess ourselves up. We're totally gonna get messed up because even now we call this parable the parable of the prodigal son. Look in your Bibles for just a moment. Those of you who have a new King James, right above verse 11, it says the parable of the lost son. And so this parable, what we're doing is we're focusing on this son that goes away. But look back quickly at verse 11. It says that Jesus said there was a certain man who had two sons. I'm going to make an argument today that the main part of this parable, the main focus of this parable is not the two sons, but the certain man. And that's why if you're taking notes, the title of the message today is the father's love displayed. The father's love displayed. Because what we're going to see is we're going to see a loving father display his love for his son in an extravagant, even a shocking way this morning. 
Because in verses 11 through 19, we see this young man go through all the ranges of emotion. We can see him go through all the ranges of his, of his actions, right? Because he goes to his father and says, Father, give me what's mine. So his son goes from being poor, right, to being very rich when he takes his inheritance. And then he goes down and he becomes very popular among the people that are around and he seeks after all the pleasure he can find. And he's on the high road. Could you imagine him walking down to this certain place that he went with all the money a man could desire? And he's going down smiling from ear to ear. But then, as we read, not long after, the story begins to shift because he runs out of money. And he goes from rich to being poor. It said that he had to sleep with the pigs, which means he went from having all these so-called friends who liked him for what he could provide to being alone. He used to live in a house, his father's house, but now he sleeps outside. His father used to provide everything, but now no one gave him anything. And so we see this young man go through all the ranges of motion. We see the heights and we see the depths. And we're going to go through that today in this parable. Now, if we read this parable and only see a wild, out-of-control son, a wild and out-of-control sinner, then we're going to miss the point of the parable entirely. We're going to miss it. Because the main point of this parable is the greatness of the father's love, not the ability of the son to sin. The sinfulness of the son is not going to be the focus, but the love of the father. Because not all of us can relate to having a life like this son. You might be sitting in here and you might be like, I've never done anything like that. Nothing like that has ever crossed my mind. So immediately you might think, well, that's good for them. That's good for that guy over there. I could tell that guy's he's a questionable character. He's probably a prodigal. I could tell by his shoes. <laughs> he's wearing checkered vans. <laughs> I have to pick up on Shad's, uh, I'm also gonna rip on Crocs later, so just be ready. I saw a few pairs already. I'm just kidding, I'm indifferent towards Crocs. Not all of us can relate to this prodigal son, this wild, out of control, crazy son. Not all of us can relate, but all of us should be able to relate to this father's love. And so rather than focusing on the son, and believe me, we're gonna talk about the son for most of today. What we're gonna do is we're gonna try to shift our focus over to see the father's love displayed. But before we jump right into the parable, I wanna bring us back a little bit. You guys remember last week, when we talked about the parable of the lost sheep and Jesus was responding to the Pharisees in verses one and two. Let's look back at those verses really quickly. They're in Luke 15 where you guys are at. Look at verses one and two because it's gonna help set the scene for us. In verse one, it says, then all the tax collectors and sinners drew near to him to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes, they celebrated that wicked people turned from their wicked ways. Is that what yours says? No, no. I have the, the CJV, the Colin, uh, my middle name is James, so Colin James Version. No, that's not what it says. And the Pharisees and the scribes complained, saying this man receives sinners and eats with them. We talked about this last week, so I don't want to belabor it, but these tax collectors and sinners didn't go and party with Jesus. They didn't drag Jesus into their sin, but what they did is they went and they heard the gospel, and they heard that they could be forgiven of their sins, that their lives could be transformed, that they didn't have to live that way any longer. And these tax collectors and these sinners, and they drew near, and they hear this, and their lives are beginning to change, and you would think the Pharisees would be like, sweet, less tax collectors. Awesome. Awesome less drunkards. No, they complained. The Pharisees could not fathom that God sought to reconcile lost sinners and wicked people to himself. The Pharisees could not fathom that the reason Jesus spent time with lost people is because all people were lost, but only some people knew they were lost. And so Jesus drawing them in and preaching the gospel and forgiving their sins, the Pharisees they, couldn't, they just couldn't stand it. And so this parable is the best possible picture that can be painted for us of the depth and the length and the height and the width of God's love. 
Jesus is going to paint an unforgettable picture here for the Pharisees. And like I mentioned, though this is one of the best known and most beloved parables, it is for a good reason. Because in this parable, we're going to come face to face with the nature and the extravagance of God's redeeming love. Jesus, in this chapter, told three parables. And all three of these parables were a response to show the Pharisees about God's heart towards saving lost people. Now, in these three parables, there were all th- all, they all have three main characters. And so we see a very clear parallel through these three parables. I'll, I'll mention them quickly. We talked last week about the lost sheep. And the three main characters were the shepherd, right? The one who went out to search for the sheep. Then we had the lost sheep. And then we had the 99 sheep that were back at the fold. You have the three main characters. And then you move on to the lost coin. And that's the one that we're skipping over because it tells the same story that the, sheep, the lost sheep told. But in that parable, if you want to read it, it's in verses 8 through 10. There's a woman who lost this coin. And she, it meant a lot to her, so she went searching for it. She flipped the house upside down. And what was she looking for? Her lost coin. Now, what was, who was the third character? Well, it was the other nine coins that she had because it said that she had 10 and she lost one. So we see the parallels. We see this shepherd searching after the sheep. We see the woman searching after the coin. And then now we see the lost son where there's a father, there's a lost son, and as we'll discover next week, there's an older brother. Now, these three groups correlate to the three groups that are present with Jesus, You have Jesus there who correlates to the shepherd, the woman, and the father. Then you have the lost sinners and the tax collectors, those who correlate to the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. But then you also have the Pharisees and the scribes. And the Pharisees and scribes correlate to the 99, the nine, and as we'll see next week, the older brother who refused to celebrate. But the main point of each of these parables is that the thing lost was recovered with great joy. Do you guys remember the picture we had last week where the the shepherd put the sheep on its shoulders and returned joyfully home? He wasn't bitter that the sheep was lost. He wasn't upset. He didn't beat the sheep or drag it home with a leash. No, he picked it up and rejoiced all the way home. And so what Jesus is going to do is he's going to use this story to teach the Pharisees about the saving nature and heart of God. Now, before some of you might be like, well, I'm already saved. I'm already a Christian. I'm going to check out. Here's the thing. And here's why I would tell you not to. Because if you understand the love of God, if you can comprehend just a little portion of the love of God, then it'll cause you to love him that much more. If you see how much God loves you, if you remember, because maybe some of you got saved when you were five or six, and you look back to that day and you don't really remember much because it was so long ago, well, let this be a picture of what has happened to you. Before we move on, I just want to define the term prodigal because I'm going to be using it over and over. The term prodigal means riotous, meaning crazy parties. It means profligate, meaning wildly extravagant. It means like without restraint, just going for it. And lastly, it means wasteful. It means wasteful. And so as we go through, we're going to look at this prodigal son, and we're going to see what we can learn from him. If you're a note taker, our first point is this, the prodigal son. The first point is the prodigal son. So let's look at this prodigal, because Jesus is going to paint a picture of these tax collectors and these sinners. These tax collectors and sinners knew they blew it, They knew they had messed up. And as Jesus is telling this story, there's no doubt in my mind that the tax collectors and sinners were sitting there thinking, man, that sounds familiar. Could you imagine? What if those tax collectors and sinners said, wait, I think I know that guy. The guy in your parable? And Jesus is like, it's a parable. It's not a, he's like, no, but I know him. I've seen it. I've lived it. Those who had squandered their lives, their money and their reputations. That's who the prodigal son is. But I also want to add this in by way of application because the prodigal son also applies to any who are far from God. Any of you here today that are far from God, look at the prodigal son and learn from him because in him you'll see how the father would feel about you coming home. In him you see the reception that you would have if you come home. So I broke it up into sub points because it helps me think through it. So if you're taking notes, our first sub point is this. So you can mark it 1A. The prodigal son 
in his wild living. His wild living. Let's look at verses 11 and 12. It says, Then he said, A certain man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. Now what we find here is that this son could not wait for his dad to die. This son couldn't wait. Have you guys ever had something that you were looking forward to? Yeah, all of you, hopefully. And in that thing you're looking forward to, you might be like, man, I just can't wait. It's like, no, you have to wait because you can't speed up time. You have to wait. Well, this son, he couldn't wait for his dad to die. He literally could not wait any longer. So he asked his dad for his portion of the inheritance. Do you guys know what inheritance is? When do you receive an inheritance? When someone passes away, right? Maybe some of your great grandparents or your grandparents have passed away and they've left you an inheritance. Well, you don't get that till they're dead. That's the way it works. You don't get that until they pass. And so rather than waiting, this son essentially says, Father, you are dead to me. Can I have what's yours? Father, you're as good as dead to me. I just, can I have what is yours? Give me what belongs to you. He might have said something like, I'm tired of being under your house and under your rules. Maybe the father was restrictive and said, son, we're gonna go to church on the Sabbath. Son, we're gonna read the Bible in the morning. Son, we don't do that in this house. And this son was sick of it. And he said, dad, you're dead to me. Give me what's mine. I wanna leave. Now here's the thing. There are many who have this attitude towards God. There are many who would say to God, God, I don't care if you're there, you're dead to me, just let me live my life the way I wanna live it. Don't bother me, don't talk to me, don't send those little Christians to come talk to me. I don't wanna hear it. And that's the picture that Jesus is painting here. That this person gets out from under the authority of his father. And mankind is constantly seeking to get out from under the authority of God. It says in Romans chapter 1, verse 21, it says, because all they, although they knew God, that is, they knew about God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but they became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. Skip down to verse 24. This is God's response. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth of God for the lie. And they worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who's blessed forevermore. I see a parallel here between Romans 1 and our parable. Because people reject God, they reject his authority, they reject his word, they push him off. And so what does God do? God gives them up. God says, fine, fine, okay. You wanna do it your way? Do it your way. And God gives them up. And I will tell you that beginning of verse 24 is a terrifying verse. You do not want that to happen to you. Because look at what they do. They go after the lusts of their hearts and they dishonor their bodies. Doesn't that sound like the prodigal son that we just read? That he went after it. His older brother reveals later that he went after prostitutes and partying. He said, Father, you're dead to me. I don't care about you. Let me do my own thing. Now, it's significant to note that at the end of verse 25 there in Romans 1, that this person did not stop worshiping God, or they did not stop worshiping. They simply stopped worshiping God. Look at what it says. They worshiped and served the creature. It's not that they stopped worshiping. It's that they changed to worship themselves. It wasn't that the son didn't want to be under any authority. It's that he didn't want to be under the father's authority, so he put himself in charge. And so Jesus speaks of those who have rejected God and want to live life on their own terms. And so he says, Father, you're dead to me. And look at, what, look at how the father responds. It says there at the end of verse 12, so he divided to them his livelihood. The father says, okay, son, no problem. I got you. Cut it in half. Save what's for your older brother. For your older brother, here's your stuff. Here you go. The father gives him his portion and in a sense, gives him up. He gives him up. He says, fine, you're gonna do it your way? Go ahead. You can do it your way. Could you imagine the broken heart of a father with their child saying, dad, I wish you were dead. I just want, I just want your stuff. I just want your money. 
heartbreaking. And yet, so often people do that to God. Some of you in this room today might be doing that with God, saying, yeah, I know about God, but I want to live my own way right now. And so let's look at what happens next in verse 13. Quite predictable, but in 13, it says, and not many days after, the younger son gathered it all together and journeyed to a far country and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. He packs it up and he bails out. He packs up what's his and he bails out. He didn't want to live under the restrictive legalistic policies of his father. He didn't want to be there with his father looking over him, judging him, telling him don't do that, telling him how to spend his money. No, he packs up and he bails out. Chances are what he did is he took all of this stuff because you can't take land with you. And that was part of the inheritance, right? You can't pick up land and take it with you. No dump trucks in those days. And so what does he do? He sells it all at a discount rate Within a couple days, he sells half of his father's estate, takes the gold, takes the cash, and bails. He wanted to get out from under his father, and that's just what he did. And so it says that he journeyed to a far country. Chances are he does this to get away from his parents. He goes into a Gentile land where he can find what his flesh desires. He gets out from under his parents. He runs away to seek after his own pleasure. Now, I want to pause here for just a moment because I've seen this cycle happen in the high school room where students will play the game throughout all high school. They'll play the game and they'll sit under their parents' roof, but in all reality, they can't wait to go to college so that they can really live. They can't wait to go to college so they could stop doing this church thing. They can't wait to go to college so they could see what it really feels like to be out there in the world. And so this son journeys to a far country and there's something about the distance that takes away from the conviction that you might feel. Well, because mom doesn't know after all. Dad doesn't know. And so he journeys and he gets out. And look at what he does there. It says that he wasted his possessions. He wasted his possessions. The word wasted means to dissipate, to squander, to waste, or to scatter. The idea is that it left quickly. He scattered it far and wide. He had a crowd. He's like, I'll buy it. I'll pay for it. I got it. Thinking that these people were his friends. Now, let me ask you a question. I need your help. What did he waste? What did he waste? His what? His what? His possessions. You're right. That's what it says. He wasted his possessions. Mm -hmm. But I will say even more so, he wasted his life. He wasted days, weeks, months of his life. The possessions were just a physical manifestation of physical view of what was happening inside. What was happening inside is that he was wasting his life. And I thought about this. We only get one shot at life, guys. Me and you, all of us. We only get one shot at life. There are no do-overs. None. And so if you're in this room today and you're like, well, I've been messing up. Hang on. We'll get there. But I'm talking to you about the long term. There's no do-overs. Once time has gone, it's over. Once a day has passed, it's gone. And so, yes, he squandered his possessions, but that was just a, a show of what was really happening. He was squandering his life. Well, how did he squander it? Well, look there at the next phrase. It says, with prodigal living. Time to wake up. <laughs> with prodigal living. You did wake up some of the students. I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> prodigal living, his openly sinful, lawless, pleasure-seeking life. That's how he wasted it. That's how he wasted his life, lawlessly, seeking after pleasure, pursuing after it. And if we're not careful, we'll waste our lives that way too. We'll forget about the fact that God is God, that he rules over heaven and earth, and that we will, in fact, answer for the things that we've done in the body, Christian and non-Christian we're all gonna answer for our lives. And so this guy goes for it. Reminded me of Solomon. Solomon and and the prodigal son run very parallel to each other because think about this for a moment. This prodigal son earned nothing. He didn't help his father build the house. He He didn't earn any of it. He didn't purchase it. No. What did Solomon do? He didn't help his father. David is the one that got 
David is the one that brought in the gold. David is the one that built the, wrote out the blueprints for the temple. David is the one who brought peace. And so King Solomon comes in and what he ended up doing is he became discontent. He became discontent with his life of pleasure, of power, prosperity. And look at what it says in Ecclesiastes 2.10. Solomon describing the way he lived his life. He said, whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure. Does that sound like the prodigal son to you guys? It does to me. He said, whatever I wanted to look at, I looked at. Whatever I wanted to partake of, I partake of. Whatever came into my heart followed my heart, right, to where it led me. Now, here's the thing. That's Solomon, and that's the prodigal. But this might sound like some of you even here today, that you can't wait to get out from under your parents' house so that you can go really live. You can't wait until you go to college because your parents can't tell you what to do there. You can't wait until you turn 18 and you could just move out because after all, your parents are cramping your style. <laughs> your parents aren't helping your riz, <laughs> right? They're killing it. <laughs> I've been counting the days since I, until I could use that. Um, I still don't entirely, I know what it means, but it's not, it's really dumb. <laughs> for those of you who use it seriously, you need help. And we have counseling available for you. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, on a more serious note, <laughs> this son, this prodigal son may hit a little bit closer to home than you might like to realize, or you might like to admit this morning. Some of you have already thought about the days you're going to go to college. Some of you have already thought, I can't wait until I get my own car and I could go and my parents don't know where I'm going. You have, yeah, that time may come. But I can tell you how it'll end for you. I can tell you how it'll end from you from the scriptures, but I can also tell you how it'll end from you from watching students crash and burn after they leave high school. It's very sad. As I follow students on Instagram and as I meet with them in the courtyard and I say, hey man, how's it going? Not good. Oh, okay, what's going on? And they tell me, I, I got off the path. I'm a prodigal. Well, I'm telling you before it happens so that you can prevent it. What if somebody came to the prodigal and said, hey, young man, I know you just asked your father for his inheritance. You don't know what you're going to do with it. Give it back. What? Why? Let me tell you a story. What if I could bring in a high school student, a previous high school student that went out on fire and ended with a different kind of fire, a crashing and burning fire? Because at the end of the day, if you go out and live it up, according to the world, I can tell you how it'll end. Look at verses 14 through 16. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in the land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. His wild, wasteful, wicked lifestyle led to a famine within his own soul. Yes, the outer famine exaggerated the issue, but at the end of the day, the true famine was the famine of his soul. It says there that he spent all. See that? The word spent all means to waste, to consume, or to spend. Because he had, or he had spent everything, he then began to be in want. Now think about this. Think about the house he came from. This is probably the first time in his entire life that he was missing his basic necessities. This is probably the first time in his entire life that he didn't have food to eat, that he didn't have a place to stay, that he didn't have people around him. And so he begins to be in want. He's suffering lack because he spent it all. He wasted it. And so where does he find himself? Well, he finds himself feeding the pigs. Truly a shameful task for an observant Jew because pigs are not kosher. They're not to be eaten by the observant Jew. And so this man is found feeding the pigs and more than anything, feeding the pigs just proves how far he's fallen. 
Because when he ran out of everything, he could have went back to his father. But no, he wanted to try to figure it out. So he joins himself to a citizen of that country. And he goes out and feeds the pigs. And he's descending into deeper and deeper and deeper darkness. And now to top it all off, no one gave him anything. He couldn't even get things from begging. You know what this prodigal son truly found? He found that the wages of sin was death. He thought that when he went out with all his money, that his return was going to be status. His return was going to be pleasure. His return was going to be a fulfilled life. But instead, he found that the wages of sin was death. All the sin that he purchased, he got paid in death. Which brings us to our second point, which is this, the prodigal son, his great awakening. The prodigal son, his great awakening, because the first word in verse 17 is very, very important. I often tell you guys to circle it. So if you see that and you're a person that writes in your Bible, circle that first word, but circle it. Why? Because what he's doing is he's indicating that there's a shift. He's indicating that there's going to be a change here. So Jesus is about to shift gears and change the story. Because up until this point, it's been completely shameful. Everything about this story has been shameful. And so now there's going to be a shift. Look at verse 17, just the beginning. It says, but when he came to himself, when he came to himself, he came to the realization of his lost condition. That's what that means. He came to himself. Have you guys ever heard someone say that they were beside themselves? You heard that saying before? You know what that means? It means that something so shocking has just happened that I feel like I'm outside my body looking in. I feel like I'm having an out-of-body experience. It doesn't feel real. I wonder if this young man had an out-of-body experience, not in like a weird new agey way where he was, you know, sitting and focusing on his belly button. But rather, he woke up one morning and he looked down and he said, why do I look so different than I used to look? What happened to my clothes? What happened to my surroundings? What happened to the roof over my head or the food on my table? And he comes to himself. Every Christian must have this moment. Every Christian must have this moment. Not the moment of gro gross and crazy sin and immorality. No, not, that's not what I'm talking about. Every Christian must have a moment where they've come to themselves and they realize that they are a, sin they are a sinner in need of a savior. Every Christian must have that moment. When was yours? When was the moment you realized, I need to be forgiven of my sins? Were you five? Were you 15? Was it last week? Maybe for some of you, it's even happening now where you've come to the place where you're like, man, that prodigal son sounds an awful lot like me. The way he treated his dad, the way he treated his family, the way he treated other people, the way he lives for pleasure. Well, then I would say you might be coming to yourself right now. We see this in Ephesians chapter two, verse 12. The apostle Paul says, at that time you were without Christ. Then he goes on to say, having no hope and without God in the world. He says, there was a time when you were lost. This prodigal son came to this place where he realized he was without Christ and he had no hope and no God. He was Christless, he was hopeless, and he was godless. And so he comes to himself. Then what happens here is exactly what happened in Acts chapter 2, verse 37. In Acts 2, verse 37, Peter was preaching on the day of Pentecost. And what he was doing is he was preaching the gospel to all the Jews that had gathered there and he was preaching to them, saying, you guys need to turn from your sins. You guys need to believe on the Messiah. And this was the crowd's response. It says, now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. They were convicted and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? That's what it looks like to come to yourself. That's what it looks like to come to the realization, to be convicted of your sin and to say, okay, Got it. I'm a sinner. I'm lost. I'm in need. Now what do I do? Where do I go from here? Now how does this happen? How does someone come to this place? How did the prodigal finally get to the place where he recognizes lostness? Well, 
I think it's what Jesus spoke about in John 16, verse 8. Speaking of the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, When he has come, he will convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. And so this man, this prodigal son, sitting with the pigs, starving to death, is finally convicted that what he did was wrong. He's finally convicted that he himself is unrighteous, that he, not his dad, that he was the one in the wrong. And so the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit opens your eyes, when he shows you yourself, you come to yourself, you recognize. But here's the thing, just recognizing you need to be saved, just recognizing you're a sinner is only the first part. You must respond to this recognition. You must respond to recognizing that you have a need. Because Hebrews 3.15, the writer of Hebrews is quoting the psalmist. He says, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, as in the day of rebellion. The psalmist said, and the the writer of Hebrews repeated it three times in this same section. He said, when you hear God speaking, don't harden your heart. Because this prodigal son, it could have said that he came to himself, but he was too ashamed to go home. He came to himself, but then he brushed it off and said, yeah, it was worse at home. That dad telling me what to do. At least now I have freedom (laughs) as he's in the pigsty with no food and no clothing. And so today, if you're hearing his voice, do not harden your heart. Do not harden your heart if God has convicted you. Run to him, as we're going to see now. Because look at how the prodigal responds. Look at how he responds at the end of verse 17, all the way down to 19. So the prodigal said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father. And I'll say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. Now he's repented in his heart and he's aware of his sin. And so he determines to go back to the father. But this time he's going on the father's terms, not his own. When he came to the father initially, he demanded, Father, give me what's mine. And he made a demand of his father. Notice what he says this time. He says, Father, make me. Make me like one of your servants. I'll do whatever you say, Father. I'll do whatever you say. I'm willing now. I know I've messed up. I'm not even worthy to be called your son. Just make me like one of your servants. It is important to note that he knew he wronged the father. You see that there at the end. the end of verse 18, he says, "Um, Father, I've sinned before you, right? And that's important. Wake up number two. Thank you. (laughs) He knew he wronged the Father, but ultimately, he recognized that he had sinned against God. Look back with me at verse 18. He says, I'll go to my Father and say, Father, I have sinned against heaven. All of a sudden, this prodigal Recognize that, yes, he had wronged his father, but ultimately his true sin was he sinned against God. He dishonored his father. He broke every one of the Ten Commandments. And so he dishonored God. He he sinned against the father. And we see this even in David's sin. When David committed adultery and then followed his adultery up with murder... He ends up saying in Psalm 54, verse 1, against you and you only I have sinned and done this evil in your sight. David says, God, I know I've wronged people. I get that. But at the end of the day, God, I've sinned against you. At the end of the day, God, I have sinned against you. And the prodigal son came to that place where he recognized, God, Father, I messed up, but I've sinned against God. And we all must come to that recognition that yes, We've treated people wrongly, but at the end of the day, our sin was that we sinned against God. And now what's going to happen is there's one great roadblock that's going to keep many outside of the kingdom of God. Because remember, Jesus is telling this to the Pharisees, and he's trying to show them that God loves to redeem lost people. 
But there is one great roadblock that will keep many out of the kingdom of God. Do you know what it is? Pride. It's pride. Because when this man came to himself, he had a choice to make. And he could have said, you know what? My father, he really was a stinker. He was no fun. He was restrictive. I think it's better I stay here. And he could have figured it out. Jesus said the same thing to the Pharisees in John chapter 5, verse 40. And I will say this morning, if you've not come to Christ, if you've not given your life to Jesus, if you've not turned from your sin, it's because of your pride. On what authority do I say that? Well, only the authority of the incarnate Son of God in John 5, 40. He says, you're not willing to come to me that you may have life. Jesus looked at the Pharisees and says, hey, you guys boast in the law and you think you get eternal life from the law, but what you need to recognize is you are not willing to come to me so that I can give you life. And so, in the prodigal's pride, he took, his, he took his inheritance and he left. In his pride, he stooped down to feed the swine. In his pride, he waited until he was literally starving to death. But listen, in his humility, he decided to return to the Father, to own his wrong, and to repent. Which brings us to our second point, which we're just going to touch on today, which is this. Our second point is this, the compassionate Father. The compassionate father. Look with me at verses 20 and 21. 20 and 21, it says, And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Verse 22. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him. And put, on a, put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. And bring the fatted calf here and kill it. And let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and he's alive again. He was lost and he's found. And they began to be merry. He throws a party. Think about what this father has endured. And he throws a party. So just like the seeking shepherd who brings the sheep home, he doesn't mourn and come home all sad, oh, I wasted a whole day looking for this sheep. No, he comes home and he throws a party and rejoices. And so then in the second parable with the woman, the diligent woman looking after her coin, she finds it and what does she do? She throws a party. She brings in her neighbor and says, hey, I lost my coin, but I found it. Come party with me. And so the father also throws a party. He rejoices. Now, the, the shepherd, you guys remember, he went seeking after his lost sheep, right? And the woman, she went seeking after her coin. But did you guys notice where, the shepherd, where this father was also seeking? This father is also seeking. He's just doing it in an entirely different way so that Jesus can show another side of how people come to salvation. So let's look first at the father's seeking love. That's our first sub point. So you could put 2A, his seeking love. Because in verse 4, we saw the shepherd go after the lost sheep. In verse 8, we saw the woman searching after the coin. Well, let's look at the father now as we see the parallel. Look at verses 20 and 21 again. It says, he arose and came to his father. Now this is the key. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And then the son, with his pre-recorded boxed meal speech, says, Father, I've sinned against heaven, and in your sight, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Do you guys notice where the father was seeking? The father was scanning the horizon. The father, in my mind, I picture a nice big yellow house with white trim, with a big wraparound porch, and a rocking chair in the front, and a big dirt road that leads as far as the eye can see. And the father is day after day after day rocking on that chair, looking at the horizon. He's looking and he's waiting. He sees the form of a person and he's like, is that him? Oh no, that's just the milkman. <laughs> he sees the form of a person. He's like, is that him? Oh, Amazon delivery, okay. <laughs> oh, there's a person. Oh, Grubhub? Who ordered Grubhub? <laughs> but then, 
this outline of a person, as the father's watching, notice what it says. When he was still a great distance off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran. The father wanted the son to come home. The father was waiting day by day, waiting for the son to come, just hoping, no doubt, praying, Father, God, bring my son home. Now, this is very important. This is key for you guys because some of you guys might think that God saved you even though he doesn't like you. That God loves you even though he really doesn't like you. No, the father wanted the son to come home and God is not indifferent about the state of the lost. God is not indifferent about lost people. No, not at all. If you're in here this morning and you've either strayed away from God, that maybe you were walking with God and you were strong in your relationship with God and then you strayed away and got over into the weeds or down in the ditch somewhere, He's not indifferent about your state. He's sitting upon the porch, scanning the horizon, waiting for you to come. For you. Am I talking about you this morning? Then don't harden your heart as he speaks to you. He wants you to come. God delights in saving lost people. In John 3, 17, the Bible says that God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. God could have sent his son into the world with a sword to cut in half all people and to show himself as king. That is going to happen, by the way. But that's the next time he comes. The first time Jesus came, it said that the world through him might be saved. God was so committed to saving lost people that he sent his only begotten son into the world. In Ezekiel 18.32, just in case you think that's just a New Testament concept, like some of maybe uh, your future Bible professors will tell you. Ezekiel 18.32 says, God says, I have no pleasure in the death of the one who dies. Says the Lord God, therefore turn and live. I want to, just for a moment, think about this. The father, day after day after day, was waiting for his son to come home. I feel like, and don't take this the wrong way, I feel like there may have been relief in the father's heart if someone came home and said, hey, your son has passed away. Why would there be relief? Because he could say, you know what? Now it's over. Now I know like this thing has been put to rest. I miss my son, but I'm not worried about him any longer. I'm not concerned about where where he's at or what kind of trouble he's gotten into. But God is altogether different. God says, turn and live. If you're in here this morning and you're fighting against God and you want nothing to do with God, God does not hate you. He doesn't even dislike you. But he's waiting for you to come. You must come. He's not gonna force you against your will. You have to come to yourself. You have to recognize you're lost and you have to come to him. The entire Bible is the story of God's redemption It took mankind about one chapter to mess it up because God created everything in the first chapter. In the second chapter, he kind of said, hey, this is how it works. And then in the third chapter, they blew it. And then the rest of the Bible, think about this. The rest of the Bible is God's history of redeeming what happened all the way back in Genesis chapter three. God could have wiped the slate clean and started over, but he didn't. Why? Well, the same reason the father ran. Look back with me at verse 20 said the father saw him and had compassion. That word compassion, it means sympathy, it means pity, it, to be, it means to be moved with compassion, to feel it in your gut is what it means. This word is often used of Jesus, who is the perfect picture of God the father. But this father saw his son, he was not angry, he was not frustrated, he was not upset, he was moved with compassion because he knew he was gonna get his son back. Now, As we begin to close, I want you guys to remember something. That before you think this is just a beautiful story of a very nice father, I want you to remember the context. This is a parable that Jesus was telling the Pharisees because the Pharisees did not know God's nature. This is not just a a nice story. It is so much more than that. This is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, revealing the love and the forgiveness that's available to everybody who comes to the Father. It's so much greater than just a nice story. I don't know about you guys, I like nice stories. Nice stories will entertain you for a moment and give you a good laugh. But guys, Jesus is talking to this crowd of lost people. Some of them, no doubt, terrible, terrible, wicked sinners. 
And they hear this message and they say, wait, the father celebrated the son coming home? The father threw a party? He killed, notice, the fatted calf? The father was prepared to throw a celebration for the coming of the son. Well, Psalm 86, 5 says, For you, Lord, are good and ready to forgive. Does that sound like the father in the prodigal son's parable? It does to me. It goes on to say, You're abundant in mercy to all those who call upon you. God stands ready to forgive. But the prodigal son, he started by living life on his terms and the father said, feel free, go. You can live life on your terms. And then the prodigal son came and said, I'm willing to do it on your terms this time. And there's some of you here today that God is waiting for you to return and say, okay, God, I've, I've messed it up. I've got this thing down into the ditch. I'm out in the weeds. I'm stuck. I've stumbled. I've fallen and I'm ready to do it your way. And if that's you, then the Bible says that God is good and ready to forgive. And so, we're going to wrap up for this week by asking a couple questions. Because the the lost son returns to the father, he's welcomed in, he's forgiven, he's restored. Let me ask you a question. Are you a Christian here today? Don't raise your hand. Are you a Christian? Meaning you're born again. You've given your life to Jesus. You've repented of your sins. You've believed on him. When's the last time you thought about the father's love? When's the last time you thought about the depths of God's love in saving you and saving me? That when you returned, he met you where you were and brought you back home. If you're a Christian here today and your life has grown cold, your heart is cold, all it takes is just a glimmer of the love of God, just the slightest view of the love of God, and your heart will be inflamed to love him. Are you a prodigal today? Let me ask you, have you come to yourself yet? Do you see the condition of your own heart and your own life? Or are you still dining with the pigs? That's a question that you need to answer for yourself. And lastly, is there a particular thing or a particular sin that's heavy on your heart today? Do you need to be reminded that God stands ready to forgive? He does not stand with a scowl looking down on you. All he says is you must confess to him. Return to him, and he will be faithful and just to forgive you of your sins. Let's pray. Father, Lord, this morning, this parable, this story, God, is quite overwhelming. God, this story is overwhelming for those of us who are believers in Christ because that has happened to us. We may not have been as bad as the prodigal, in the sense of his wildly extravagant lifestyle. But Lord, I agree with the Apostle Paul when he said that Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I'm chief. I would argue with Paul. No, 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 Paul, I'm, I'm chief. And Jesus, you said that he who is forgiven much also loves much. Well, I pray that these students, Lord, that you would stoke the flame of their heart God, those of these students that are believers in Christ, that their heart would be inflamed with the love of God, that they would seek to comprehend the incomprehensible love of Christ, which is higher, wider, deeper, and further than we could ever imagine. And Father, there's some in here also that as as they've been sitting in these seats this morning, they've come to recognize that they are the prodigal. They are the one that has gone off and gone astray and now they're, as it were, dining with pigs. Well, Lord, you've confronted them this morning by your spirit and with your word. God, I pray that they would make the right decision. I pray that you'd put it in their hearts to return to you and find you faithful to meet them on the road. Lord God, I pray that you'd fill our hearts with joy because of your great love, that you would inflame our spiritual lives, God, so that we don't go cold, grow cold in these last days, but that we'd follow you faithfully all the way to the end. God, we love you. God, we thank you. Lord God, we rejoice uh, that you saved us, and we just can't fathom that you rejoice that you saved us. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name.